Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to our April webinar today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the center before we get going here. So for those of you who are less familiar with us, the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment is an organized research unit here at the University of Texas at Austin, comprised of uh, 26 researchers who work on a broad range of different um, subsurface energy related topics. Um, we have a, a lot of a lot of great stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> the research involves several different um, subsurface applications, various technical disciplines, and we use various engineering tools. Um, a lot of our work does focus on conventional oil and gas, but we're getting more into um, sustainable energy, low carbon energy, geothermal, carbon capture, um, and as I'll talk about today, a little bit more on hydrogen. Um, we are have a lot of reservoir engineering experience, a lot of petrophysics experience, and of course, data analytics and machine learning, um, as well as a lot of other different topics, production engineering, geomechanics, um, to get to get our research done. We use a variety of engineering tools from experiments to simulation um, on all kinds of different scales. <clears throat> Much of our research takes place through a number of industrial affiliate programs. Uh, these are ways uh, that we have of interfacing with industry to do research that um, explores the fundamentals of the subsurface, but also eventually does benefit um, you all out there who, who use it. So here's um, a list of the uh, IAPs that we have. Uh, you can go to our website and find out more information on these and uh, how to, you know, or who to contact uh, if you're interested in uh, more information. <clears throat> Now about our monthly webinar series, we have these webinars um, every month on the second Tuesday of the month, and they're intended to be informative, industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators here in CSE. So we want these to be educational and give you all out there uh, some uh, you know, indication of the cool stuff that we're working on. So like I said, we have them on the second Tuesday of each month um, at noon central time, and these are on uh, Teams. We upload the webinars to our YouTube channel within a few days. And here's a couple of examples of recent webinars that we've had. So if you missed today's webinar or you wanna go back and watch some of it again, you'll be able to do that. Um, just a plug for our upcoming webinars on uh, May 14th, we have uh, Dr. Okuno uh, will be giving a talk. And then on uh, June 11th, uh, Dr. Hidari. And finally, on July 9th, uh, we'll have Dr. Perch. So um, we'll distribute more information on these in uh, as the time approaches. One thing I want to mention is that we now have uh, sponsorship opportunities for our webinars. Um, it's $5,000 per webinar. You get your name and logo prominently displayed in the webinar, and you uh, get that out to our live and audience, which is industry, government, and academics. Um, and we publicize this to both public and private audiences. And then it gets posted to YouTube. And our YouTube channel is doing pretty well. We've got, you know, over 14,000 views in the last two years. A lot of these webinars have, you know, many hundreds or thousands of views after the event. So it'll stay out there in cyberspace. And the benefits to you are that you're able to reach a global targeted audience and associate your brand with the high quality research and education that we do here in the center. And you're able to help support our mission of advancing research and education for a subsurface energy in the environment. So if you're interested, contact me. There's my email, Daigle at Austin, um, for more information. Okay. So I have the pleasure of introducing myself today. The person who was uh, supposed to introduce me had a last minute conflict. So, so here we are. Um, anyway, I'm Hugh Daigle. I'm an associate professor here in the uh, Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. I'm also the director of CSEE. And I'm going to be talking today about challenges and opportunities with geologic hydrogen. Um, just a little bit of background. I have a bachelor's degree in earth science from Harvard, and my PhD is also in earth science from Rice. So I'll be uh, throwing some geology at you today for sure. Um, I have about five years of industry experience with uh, Chevron and Schlumberger and a couple of other companies. And I've been here at UT since 2013. So <clears throat> working, on, uh, working on about 11 and a half years now. Um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, if you have a question during the webinar, uh, please post it in the Q&A section and I will deal with those after I get to the end of the talk. Uh, we'll get through as many as we can. 
And again, as I mentioned, this presentation will be uploaded to our YouTube channel within a few days. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So I am happy to be here today to talk to you all about challenges and opportunities with geologic hydrogen. So just to set the stage here, um, if we look at scenarios where future global warming is kept at or below this one and a half degrees Celsius threshold above the 1850 to 1900 average, um, most or all of the projections out there show that we need to be at net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So this is just one particular scenario that the IEA, the International Energy Agency, published in 2022, showing that to get to, you know, keeping our warming below one and a half degrees, we have to get our net emissions down here to zero or even a little bit less than zero by 2050. And uh, that involves decarbonizing a number of different sectors, including electricity, industry, transport, and, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So um, there are a number of different things that need to happen for that to be able to work. Um, but one of them is a lot of these scenarios involve uh, an increasingly significant role for hydrogen. Um, hydrogen can be important for decarbonizing industries that we call hard to abate industries. And these include things like cement manufacturing and steel making. The reason those are so hard to abate is that it's not just that they are using fossil fuels to you know, provide energy inputs for what they're doing. There is also um, carbon emissions intrinsically associated with some of the chemical processes that happen here. So for example, with cement manufacturing, um, when you um, calcine the, the limestone that you put into that, you produce lime, which is calcium oxide, plus CO2, and you just can't get away from that. Um, so you can reduce some of your emissions by including hydrogen as possibly a fuel source for your furnaces and that sort of thing. Um, but that, that still remains there. Same thing with steel making. Um, when you reduce iron oxide that's in the iron ore, that releases carbon dioxide as well. Um, so you can do certain things here to reduce the carbon intensity of these industries. And part of that could possibly be using hydrogen as an energy source. Um, hydrogen is also an important feedstock for synthetic fuels. A lot of you have probably have been reading about these things called e-fuels, which are um, essentially, you know, syngas, uh, or you know, synthetic ethanol and things like that made with hydrogen and uh, hydrogen that's produced in a you know, carbon neutral way plus CO2 that's been captured from the atmosphere. Um, so these can be used for like you know, synthetic jet fuels or things like that. Hydrogen itself can be a transportation fuel, um, although I think the jury's still out on whether that's the best use of it. Um, and finally, we can use it for electricity generator uh, generation by running it um, through a fuel cell. Um, if you look at the projections of what the hydrogen market will be in the future, if it's included to the extent that we need for this net zero um, carbon uh, situation, it could potentially have a two and a half trillion dollar global market by 2050. And the United States component of that could be $750 billion. So there's a tremendous um, business opportunity here. Um, and um, you can see here, this is uh, by 2050, according to the DOE, they see the total hydrogen market just in the United States scaling up to 41 uh, million tons per year compared to about nine or 10 uh, where we are right now. So that's a big scale up. And uh, when you look at the IEA uh, projections, so again, this is using that scenario that I just showed you two slides ago. We're going to have a huge increase in demand specifically for low emissions hydrogen. So this is hydrogen that's either produced by electrolysis using uh, clean energy like wind or solar or, that, or, or nuclear, that sort of thing, um, or possibly by steam methane reforming with carbon capture. Um, and you can see that it, you know, we'll go from a little under 100 million tons globally uh, demand in 2022 to over 400 uh, by 2050 with all kinds of new uses that we don't have right now. Most of the hydrogen that's produced nowadays, you know, right now is used either for chemicals or for oil refining. Um, 
thought we were going to have a lot of different uses. OK, so where's all this hydrogen going to come from? OK, so hydrogen is a tricky thing because um, nearly, well, I don't want to throw a number out there because I don't remember off the top of my head, but the vast majority of the hydrogen that is used globally right now is produced from natural gas. Um, so either with or without carbon capture. Um, but we need to scale that up and include other things like, um, you know, producing it from electricity. And so you need feedstocks for that and you need energy. And that goes in here to the electricity. It produces water. Um, sometimes you'll produce CO2 when you're forming the hydrogen. That needs to be captured and stored. And then you'll produce the hydrogen in a number of different forms that then needs to be stored and transmitted and distributed. So we talk about you know, tanks and underground storage and then different ways of moving this stuff around with, you know, either in a gaseous phase or in some kind of a, a hydrogen carrier and eventually getting that through your distribution network to your end demand. And this entire hydrogen energy value chain needs to be scaled up very rapidly and it has a lot of different components. It's kind of like the, reminds me a little bit of the conspiracy theory guy. Um, but what if we could simplify that? Okay, so rather than having this really complicated way of making the hydrogen, moving it around, what if we can just get hydrogen somehow? And then we can transmit it the way we already know how to transmit natural gas um, and then get it to the end user. This would be a much simpler way, potentially, of going about getting hydrogen. And so the question is, where is this going to happen? So let me tell you about a place in Mali over in West Africa. Borake Bugu, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but that's my best rendition of that is a village in Mali. It's about 50 kilometers northwest of the capital, Bamako. And there is a significant underground hydrogen resource in this area of Mali. So in 1987, workers were drilling a water well and they uh, discovered accidentally um, that there was hydrogen, a significant amount of hydrogen coming out of that well. Um, I think somebody's cigarette lit it on fire. Fortunately, nobody was killed, but um, that was an accidental discovery. And it's 98% pure. And right now they've drilled enough wells and they have enough resource that it um, provides all the electricity for the village um, by running it through a, a combustion uh, uh, turbine. Yeah, it flows at about 1500 cubic meters per day, which is equivalent to 53 uh, MSCF. And it is more or less a conventional accumulation of gas. There's some dolomite and sandstone reservoirs um, that you can see here in the logs. So that's um, some of the reservoir there and then um, some more up there. I guess that's labeled shale. But um, anyway, um, you can see here on the neutron and density logs, um, you know, hydrogen obviously has a very high hydrogen index because it's just hydrogen. And so um, it captures a lot of or it slows down a lot of those thermal neutrons. And so you see this anomalously high uh, neutron porosity. Um, what's interesting about this though, is it appears to be continuously recharged. So there's some source of hydrogen that is charging this reservoir. So this is very interesting. Now here's another place where um, a you know, significant flow of natural hydrogen has been discovered. This is a mine in Albania, and this is just was just recently uh, published back in uh, February of this year. Um, it's a chromium mine, and uh, here's a picture of it. It's in um, it's in a type of rock called an ophiolite, which we'll get more into that uh, in a, in a minute. That's probably significant here. Um, in this mine, they've had several major explosions since 1992, and these have been linked to seepage of hydrogen. And currently. Right now, there is a flow of hydrogen coming up from what they think is a fault zone that the mine has intersected. And it flows at about uh, 215 MSCF per day. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty significant. And they think that they just managed to tap into this fault zone that was charged with hydrogen. It's not clear whether that hydrogen is being recharged or not. 
Um, but you know, for now, it's they're getting a pretty significant flow rate. So, you know, these things are around. Here's another example. This is a place in Turkey where there is a um, a gas seep that is mostly methane, but somewhere between seven and a half and eleven point three percent hydrogen, and it's continuously burning. It's uh, believed to be the source of the um, the first Olympic flame. Um, back in the, uh, well, I forget what year that was, but that was a long, very long time ago. Um, this is also associated with this type of rock called an uh, ophiolite, which is a potential source of naturally occurring hydrogen. So these are just three you know, fairly well-known and, and publicized um, places where there is hydrogen naturally seeping up from underground. But when you start looking around the world, there are discoveries of hydrogen nearly everywhere. Um, so this is a map from a very nice review paper by Zagonic from back in, in 2020, um, just listing out locations where there have been discoveries of hydrogen in abundances greater than 10%. So sometimes mixed with natural gas. Obviously, here's uh, Borakabugu in Mali, which is 98% you know, pure hydrogen. Um, but they're really all over the place. Um, one thing you'll notice is that a lot of the um, the discoveries are focused around uh, Russia and uh, Eastern Europe and former Soviet republics. And there's kind of an interesting side side note story here, which is that um, during the Soviet era, I'm sure you know many of you know this, um, there was an alternative hypothesis about the generation of natural gas that it came from very, very deep, within the crust or maybe even the mantle. This is the uh, abiotic gas theory. And so um, to try to you know, prospect for natural gas and also to determine if that you know, theory was, uh, was correct, there was a lot of very deep drilling um, in, the, in the Soviet bloc looking for sources of abiotic gas. And a lot of the time when they drilled very deep, they found hydrogen. So it's definitely, you know, definitely find it there, but we find it, you know, in Canada, the United States, and, you know, depending on who you ask, the fact that there's none down here in South America, that's probably just, if you went out and looked for it, I, I'm sure you would find it. It's, you know, hydrogen appears to be, uh, you know, naturally occurring hydrogen appears to be much more abundant than maybe we realize. Now, here's what we don't know, and it's a lot. So first of all, what is the global resource potential? Um, once we figure that out, what are the characteristics of the best places to look for geologic hydrogen? How do we even know where to go? Uh, what type of prospecting techniques can we use if we want to try to exploit this as a natural resource? How do we get it out from the ground? And then how do we transport it and monitor to prevent or mitigate leakage to the atmosphere? I mean, these are big questions. You can think of it uh, as, if we're really going to try to exploit this naturally occurring hydrogen, we have to stand up a twin of the oil and gas industry. Um, and this is a big task. There's a lot of commonalities with oil and gas prospecting, but there's a lot of different things. So I'm gonna give you some you know, background on, on how to answer these questions and then present a roadmap of future resource to really figure out, or excuse me, future research to figure out if we can really make this work. Okay, so first of all, what is the global resource potential? We really just don't have a really great handle on that. Um, a lot of this has to do with, we don't really understand if hydrogen accumulates over geologic time, like a conventional gas reservoir, or do we have to just rely on in situ generation over short time scales? Um, the um, accumulations in Mali are kind of interesting because they're in, more or less conventional reservoir rock, but there appears to be a continuous charge. The uh, hydrogen pressure and the concentration actually has increased over time. So um, that's a little bit different from a conventional, you know, um, you know, natural gas deposit. Um, and in fact, in his paper, Zagonic argues that hydrogen uh, does not accumulate over geologic time because 
uh, it diffuses away too quickly. It can diffuse through the cap rock. And, you know, again, this isn't on like, you know, year time scales. This is like over millions of years. So he's arguing that you're not going to find these big conventional deposits of hydrogen. You need to find places where it's being you know, generated rapidly enough that you can recover. it. And so um, the observed accumulations that we see, they might be very young and they might require self recharge really to be economic. Okay, so that's a big question, and that's still unanswered. Um, depending on who you ask, there is could be potentially a lot. Um, so, you know, the USGS has put out this number about 10 trillion tons in place. That I think that assumes that there is some geologic trapping, although I'm not entirely sure. Um, the other estimate um, from Zagonic's tabulation is that it could be 20 million tons per year being generated in situ, okay? So when you look again at the projected demand by 2050, so 400-ish million tons, 10 trillion tons is plenty to take care of that. Um, 20 million tons per year um, is not, you know, it's a chunk of that, but not, you know, not very much of it. But here's the deal. These numbers are very, very, very poorly constrained. And when I say very, very, very poorly constrained, I think, you know, many or like they could vary by several orders of magnitude okay we don't even know what we don't know i'll talk about you know hydrogen in the mantle and the core here in a little bit and that's just you know very poorly understood right now so you know i, I don't know someone should look at this right <laughs> so anyway um so that's resource estimates um we have some you know kind of you know ballpark understanding of that but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to figure that out Okay, now what is the source of geologic hydrogen? There's, you know, it can be many different sources, but the main ones that people talk about are this process called serpentinization, which is a metamorphosis of um, mantle rocks that happens and releases hydrogen. Um, there's radiolysis of water, so naturally occurring elements that uh, decay radioactively, so potassium, uranium, thorium. The um, uh, uh, radioactive energy can actually break apart water and produce a small amount of hydrogen. Um, and then there could be a deep source in the mantle or the core, and this is very poorly constrained. Okay, so let's talk about serpentinization. So this is fun, you know, I, you know, have the, have this background in geology, and here I am, you know, giving you all a talk where we get to talk about serpentinization. It's like I never, never thought the day would come. Okay, so the mineral olivine, is a mixture of uh, magnesium silicate and iron silicate. So we have two different minerals called forsterite and phaolite. The olivine is a solid solution of those. And so this two here, it's actually, you can have different proportions of magnesium and, and iron. Um, but the important thing here is the phaolite. So under reducing conditions, phaolite can react with water to produce iron oxide, silica, and hydrogen, okay? And this is part of the serpentinization reaction. This occurs at between 200 and 315 degrees Celsius, and the fluids have to be undersaturated in carbonate, okay? So these are the three conditions I highlighted, reducing fairly high temperature, undersaturated with respect to carbonate. If you don't meet some of those, uh, you may not have optimum rates of serpentinization. So figuring out where that happens is a big question. Now, where do we find olivine? So here's a nice chart of igneous rocks, okay? And they go from felsic here on the left to ultramafic here on the right. And that really just depends on the, the mineral assembly. So felsic rocks like granite are mostly quartz, felds, and uh, feldspar with a little bit of, of mica. Um, but as you lose the quartz and you get more of these minerals like pyroxene and olivine, those are what we call mafic rocks, and actually ultramafic rocks are predominantly olivine. Um, so, you know, here's granite. So I'm from New Hampshire. Here's the old man of the mountain. That's actually a, uh, um, a grant. This uh, type of rock is a granodiorite. So it's kind of here between granite and diorite. Um, but really, we're looking for hydrogen production. We want to focus on these ultramafic rocks, specifically this type of rock called peridotite. So what is peridotite? Peridotite is what most of the upper mantle is composed of. Um, so here we've got a nice illustration of a mid-ocean ridge. So the oceanic crust is basalt. And then here 
in the mantle, um, we have peridotite. So that's going to be your ultramafic rock. And it extends from the base of the crust, which here is the Mohorovicic discontinuity, um, down here to the, um, oh, I'm going to do my professor is a really, really not going to be proud of me. This thing is the D double prime discontinuity. Anyway, you can tell me, tell me that I'm wrong with my deep earth stuff. Um, but there's, there's a lot of it. Um, the key, though, is defining it where it's close to the surface. And that is usually where the crust is thin, for example, near mid-ocean ridges. It's very difficult to drill through continental crust and get to peridotite um, that directly that way because that distance is like 35 to 50 kilometers. So you want to look for it where the crust is thin. So one way to do that is to look for these type of deposits called ophiolite complexes. These are rocks, they're formed um, when oceanic crust and upper mantle are abducted onto a continent. So abducted is the opposite of subducted. So they're somehow placed up onto a continent um, and they contain a uh, peridotite down here that you can actually find on the surface. Um, the uh, Greek word ophis uh, means snake and that's where ophiolite comes from. And um, that's actually a similar uh, origin to serpentinization. And the reason we use those terms is because the um, serpentinized uh, rock has an appearance like a snake skin. And so that's why, that's why we call it that. So these ophiolite complexes are exposed all around the world. Some of the more famous ones here are the uh, Samael ophiolite in um, Oman, which is a beautiful place if you ever have a chance to go there. Um, Cyprus has some. Um, there's some out in California as well, but they're, they're globally distributed. Um, so this is one you know, potential place you can look for ultramafic rocks. Um, specifically within the United States, we have a number of these ultramafic complexes around uh, both within the Appalachian Mountains, where they've been included in some of the folding and thrusting there, and then as well out here on the West Coast with a couple scattered around in between. Now, these are ultramafic rocks. They're at the surface, okay? So remember what I said about for serpentinization to occur, you need to have the right conditions, and that uh, includes some element of elevated temperature. So you're probably not going to be generating hydrogen um, in situ at these outcrops, but you can look in other places where you might expect ultramafics to occur. And here's an example of one such place. It's the Mid-Continent Rift, which is an ancient buried failed rift basin that is in kind of the upper Midwest under Lake Superior. Um, with a little bit going into Canada. Um, we know that this um, area is perspective for hydrogen. There's some um, natural gas wells in Kansas that have elevated hydrogen concentration. And um, recently there's been some drilling activity specifically for hydrogen in Nebraska. So this is definitely an area of interest. Um, and this is just an idea that, you know, some of these other Precambrian rift basins that exist around the world might be a good place to look for geologic hydrogen. So, you know, I know that there's a lot of activity in Australia right now, but, you know, Canada could have these um, parts of Africa. So there's a lot of different places where you can think about looking at the geologic characteristics of, of what you're getting after. Now, figuring out where you've actually got serpentinized rock or ongoing serpentinization, that's a whole other thing that is still not very well constrained. Okay, let's talk also about hydrogen coming out of the mantle or the core. So there's evidence that as you drill very, very deep, you get more and more hydrogen content in the gases that you find. And so this is a clue to maybe that there's a deep source of hydrogen somewhere, possibly the mantle, possibly even the core where the hydrogen is diffusing back up into the crust. Um, there's some very recent work that suggested that the chemistry of the lower mantle is amenable to hydrogen separating itself for water. It's uh, thought to be a strongly reducing environment, and this could be a potential source of mantle hydrogen. And so here's how it might work. As you've got a plate subducting, so subducted plates kind of 
crash and burn down here at the bottom of the mantle. And if you've got any kind of hydrous minerals down here, so for instance, a, a hydrous um, iron mineral, what's going to happen is because this is such a strongly reducing environment, the hydrogen is going to be liberated and you'll have free hydrogen, um, actually H2 existing um, down here in the lower mantle. So could this hydrogen eventually diffuse upward? Um, you know, it's, it, it's possible. Um, Here's another, um, you know, possible scenario um, where it could be associated with with diamonds. So you you, know, you do find hydrogen associated with um, uh, these kimberlite deposits, which you know have are thought to have a source very you know very deep in the lower mantle. So um, you know that's another possible clue and possible mechanism you could look at. Um, and so you know you could have hydrogen you know coming down in your subducting slab and um, maybe even partitioning into the outer core. There's some, there's some thought that there could be a fairly significant amount of hydrogen in the core, which could explain the, uh, the core mass deficit problem. Um, but also there could be this primordial hydrogen, which was uh, generated from water that was present at the time of Earth's accretion. So this is an interesting paper by Togawa et al, where they're looking at the amount of hydrogen in the core over time during the accretion of Earth. And, you know, it's not like a huge concentration, but there could be a significant amount. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, the, the key here is that we're just beginning to start to understand this, and we really have no idea how much hydrogen could be in the mantle in the core. So there could be a lot, there could be very little. Um, whether that's a significant source for crustal accumulations or crustal generation is really just not known. Okay, so as far as where we look to find geologic hydrogen, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. So, you know, even if you've got ultramafic rocks, what is controlling where serpentinization would actually be ongoing? What, you know, what, how do we look for that? What are the, what are the clues or what are the environments where we want to look? Um, how much hydrogen is in the mantle and the core, if any? And how fast does it move into the crust? Again, you know, very little constraints on that. And then, you know, not only that, but how do you then associate a source of hydrogen with somewhere that it might accumulate? Okay, so the wells at Burakibugu are, we don't know where that hydrogen is coming from. It's really, it's not constrained. Um, you know, one practice is just to look for somewhere that hydrogen has been found and then drill close to that. Um, that, you know, that's one way of doing it. And obviously that's one way of producing oil and gas as well. Um, but there might be a smarter way that we can do that. And that is just not very well understood right now. Okay, so let's imagine we get that all figured out. Now, you've got to have a way of prospecting for hydrogen. And we can think of this as an analog to what we do for you know, conventional oil and gas. So you look for surface seeps. Here's an oil seep in, uh, in California. Um, you use some kind of remote sensing, either seismic data or you know, magnetotellurics or gravity, and you know, combine those things together and you figure out where this stuff is accumulating. So now let's think about mapping oil and gas prospecting onto geologic hydrogen. Okay, so hydrogen seeps. Here's the problem with hydrogen. You can't see it and you can't smell it, okay? <laughs> and the other thing is that if you're not expecting it to be there, you generally aren't going to measure, uh, you, you won't try to detect it. OK, so you'll go out looking for methane seeps and you'll bring your methane detector. But what if there's hydrogen? You won't be able to, to measure it. And th the reality is that most modern gas chromatographs, they use hydrogen as the carrier gas. And so they are designed not to detect hydrogen. You have to have a special detector to be able to, to be able to find it. And so I think, you know, this right here, this technological thing is a little bit of an impediment to our understanding of how abundant uh, geologic hydrogen is. So um, we need some better design of gas sensors to be able to detect hydrogen along with other gases. So here's an interesting thing that, um, you know, that's, you know, fairly recently been figured out. So 
these anomalous circular depressions that are found in many places around the world, they're either called fairy circles or Carolina bays. Um, these are um, actually indicative possibly of hydrogen seepage. So here's a picture of a bunch of fairy circles in Namibia. This is water filled, um, these Carolina bays. This is in uh, North Carolina, I believe, these circular you know, depressions that form. And so there's been some very interesting work done looking at hydrogen concentrations associated with these features. So here are some surveys of a couple of Carolina bays in North Carolina. And what we're looking at here, the size of these circles corresponds to the hydrogen concentration that was measured. And you can see that as you approach the um, edge of the Carolina Bay, the hydrogen concentration increases um, a lot. And if you look at a couple of transects here across it, you can see that the um, there's a you know pretty high, well, I'm, I mean, you know, it's still hundreds of parts per million, but much higher than background hydrogen flux in, in these features. Um, this has also been uh, demonstrated in Western Australia, and then also near Borakabuku in Mali, um, we also have these features. So these, you know, could be indications of surface seepage of hydrogen. And when you, you back up and start looking at how many of these things are around. So this is just a map of North Carolina and all of these orange features are um, Carolina bays that have been mapped from satellite data. And there's a lot of these. So, you know, is there a significant hydrogen resource underneath North Carolina? You know, not clear. Um, USGS thinks there could be along the whole east coast of the US with associated with ultramafic rocks from the rifting of the Atlantic Ocean. Could these be a surface expression of that? Not sure. Um, someone should go out and look at it. Okay, so that's looking for seeps. Now, what about um, active source seismic? Here's the problem. If you're looking specifically for ultramafic rocks, they're really hard to see in any great level of detail from um, reflection seismic. And that's because they're usually deep and they're often highly fractured, particularly if they've been serpentinized. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Um, and you know, for those of you who are used to looking at industry seismic data, you're probably looking at this and saying, what the, <laughs> what in the world is this? Um, but so this is a, a lake seismic survey that was done in Lake Superior back in 1988. And so what we're looking at here, this is the, in the mid-continent rift, here's the, the, the basement rock. So this is you know, expected to be mafix. Um, here we've got the moho indicated. And this would be your ultramafic stuff down here. Very hard to see any detail in there. Um, here's a more modern example. This is the um, Southwest Indian Ridge. Again, um, this is going to be the uh, upper mantle down here. It's very close to the surface because we're near a spreading center. And you know, it, it's hard to make out what's going on there. So one possibility that um, has come along in the um, you know kind of geologic community that's looking at um, um, you know, these, uh, you know, mid-ocean ridges is some kind of a, you know, combination of uh, magnetotelluric and seismic survey. So the, the reason this works is that if you're looking for what we call altered mantles, this is the serpentinized peridotite, um, when that gets altered, you increase the porosity and the, the fracture density. And so that altered mantle will have a lower, much lower resistivity than the unaltered uh, crystalline crust or upper mantle. And so this is something you might actually be able to see with a magnetotelluric survey. And this is where, where the hydrogen is going to be generated. Okay. So um, here's an example from Corsaria et al. This is looking at a, um, uh, rel uh, yeah, relic spreading center in the Barents Sea, the Burena Basin. Um, and what they've done here is they've got a resistivity structure and then a velocity model from seismic. And they can combine those together and start identifying features um, where they think they've got, you know, serpentinized upper mantle based on the combination of the velocities and the resistivity. You can also, um, there's, you also have to do a density inversion as well. So, you know, you could figure this out and say, oh, okay, maybe we could actually drill here and see, you know, how much hydrogen there is. So this could be a promising prospecting tool. 
Um, another prospecting tool that's been um, studied recently is um, using passive seismic. So to do passive seismic, you pick an area and you set out a bunch of seismometers and they just record ambient noise and you know faraway earthquakes and, and that sort of thing. And then you invert what's been recorded to tell something about the structure or the fluids of the subsurface. We can you know, infer acoustic velocities, fluid content, and other things. Um, this is done a lot for like deep earth seismology, but it can also, uh, it's got a lot of good applications for um, near surface uh, things as well. So um, here's an example from Southern France. So in the area around Po, there are several um, uh, uh, hydrogen anomalies in the soil. You can see these areas where you've had got high hydrogen concentration that's been mapped. And so um, there's so they did a, um, a passive seismic survey here and inverted for uh, the characteristics of fluid motion. And so what you can see is, you know, between the rock 80 to 140 meters below the ground and then a deeper rock, you can see changes in the, um, this is specifically looking at acoustic attenuation. And this is inferred to be evidence of migrating fluids, possibly containing hydrogen. So you can do this and look for places where you've got fluid migration and combine that with, you know, some kind of a measurement of, you know, hydrogen seepage or hydrogen in the soil and get some idea about where you might actually be able to go out and prospect for this. Okay. So let's now imagine that you figured all this out. You're ready to dr drill your well. You're ready to complete it and start producing your geologic hydrogen. Okay, so if you're lucky, you can just drill into an existing accumulation and produce it just like a conventional gas well. And so this is what they do um, at Boreke Bugu. They, you know, there's your wellhead. Um, there is a drill rig. It's all very, very conventional. Um, you might also use some techniques that would be familiar in the oil and gas industry. You can try to increase um, permeability and increase reactive rock surface area to stimulate serpentinization by fracking. Um, you can inject foam to try to scavenge some of the uh, some of the hydrogen that's down there and get it to come out faster. And then there's some work that's gone going to try to speed up the rate of hydrogen generation, including using microbes. Um, using thermal stimulation and even injecting um, catalysts downhole to try to speed up the generation of hydrogen. And in fact, this issue of producing the hydrogen was um, part of a recent round of funding from ARPA-E. This is, um, I believe, the first federal funding here in the U.S. we've had for um, geologic hydrogen. And um, I'm Proud to say that um, UT overall did very well with this um, this call for funding. We had two projects in CSEE get funded. One is uh, Dr. Song is the PI, and I'm I'm involved in that one. And then the other one, um, Dr. Espinosa and Dr. Foster are partnering with uh, LBNL um, on their project. So um, between that and then uh, the Bureau of Economic Geology also got a project to look at. Um, catalyst enhanced uh, stimulation. So uh, this is definitely an area that you're going to want to keep an eye on because um, there's more federal money coming down the road for this and we've got a lot of cool stuff just getting started here um, at UT. So I think there's uh, there's cool stuff that you'll probably be seeing uh, here in the future. Okay, so now let's imagine you've gotten it out of the ground, you've solved all those problems, and you need to move the hydrogen around to where it needs to go. Um, so, you know, it's not entirely clear whether uh, if we have significant production of geologic hydrogen, what that does for the subsurface hydrogen storage uh, picture. And, you know, I think that's also an open question. But, you know, let's imagine we just want to deal with it the way we deal with conventional gas. OK, um, so first of all, we've got about three million miles of natural gas pipelines. Um, here's a picture um, from the uh, EIA. Um, a couple of things you want to note. There are some places where geologic hydrogen might be produced that lack infrastructure. So you would need to build out. So I'm specifically going to call out North Carolina 
sorry guys, if you've got a lot of hydrogen underneath those Carolina bays, you're going to need a lot of pipelines that you don't have. So there's an infrastructure issue here. But also something you need to think about, and this actually is common to both geologic hydrogen and other types of hydrogen, is that you know about half of the pipelines that are out there are plastic, but the other half are some type of steel. Okay. And this is a problem because hydrogen is highly corrosive and highly reactive with steel. It has all kinds of different ways of getting into the steel and causing problems. So it can just diffuse in and accumulate in voids um, between the actual atoms in the steel. It can exploit surface cracks and start absorbing there. Um, it can cause the atoms to you know, break apart from each other. And this is called decohesion. Um, you can form hydrides and cracks. You can, if you're unlucky, really unlucky, you can have it turn into methane um, or just in general, get in there and disrupt the actual structure of the steel. And all this, you know, serves to um, cause the steel to develop cracks and eventually holes where the hydrogen could leak. So one possibility is to use um, plastic pipes. Um, it'll diffuse a little bit faster than methane. It's got, you know, the Van der Waals radius is about, you know, 289 picometers instead of 380. So it diffuses through a little bit faster. Um, if you, here's a study that was done looking at the gas loss rate with blended hydrogen methane mixtures. Um, when you've got 100% hydrogen over here, you could be losing, you know, 300 something cubic feet per mile per year. So that's about six and two thirds times higher than the leak rate with um, methane, um, but that's still, um, you know, relatively small. So this could be a possible way of mitigating those issues. Um, you know, why do we want to prevent leakage? It's not just that you're losing a valuable commodity, but um, hydrogen is kind of an indirect greenhouse gas. So the way it works is it disrupts these hydroxyl radicals. Um, and hydroxyl radicals help um, oxidize methane. So methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, but it has a short lifetime in the atmosphere because of reactions with hydroxyl radicals. Eventually it gets turned into, into carbon dioxide. But the problem is that hydrogen will go and react with those hydroxyls and um, it'll remove them. And so this has the net effect of lengthening the lifetime of methane in the atmosphere. Um, and it also increases the water vapor concentration because of the um, products of that reaction. And both methane and water are very strong greenhouse gases. So um, it's been estimated that after 100 years in the atmosphere, hydrogen has a global warming potential of about 11 with some uncertainty on there. And that's, uh, you know, the amount of energy trapped relative to what CO2 traps. So it's pretty, um, and that's just due to this reduction in, in OH radicals. So it's not that the hydrogen itself is such a big deal, but it reacts with things that we would prefer to keep in the atmosphere. And so we really wanna to try to minimize those leakage. Okay. Um, what about hydrogen carriers? Well, these have their own issues, right? So ammonia uh, conversion and reconversion uses about 40% of the hydrogen energy content. Same thing with liquid organic hydrogen carriers. So these there's things like benzene and that sort of thing. Um, you, you know, lose a lot of uh, energy content with the conversion processes there. Um, there's a lot of work on hydrogen carriers ongoing, and I think this should be of interest to anybody interested in hydrogen, whether or not you're looking at geologic hydrogen. Okay, so um, I am promised you I would finish up with a, a roadmap of what I think we need to do to make geologic hydrogen work. So, we need to work on the exploration aspect. So resource assessment, um, where do we look for hydrogen? What are the characteristics of good places to look? How do we look for it? How do we prospect for it? Then we need to work on the production side. So, you know, enhanced recovery, stimulation, drilling, fracking, and in situ generation could be very important for this. And then finally, um, oh, well, this, this should say transportation, but that's okay. Um, we need um, better sensors for monitoring leaks, better ways of detecting leaks, pipeline materials, 
that are hydrogen carriers. But if we get this all worked out, then we can potentially unlock a nice source of abundant low carbon energy. So I would say there's still a lot to be done on the basic understanding side, but I think this is an interesting area of research and you're going to see more on this hopefully in the future. So um, that concludes my presentation and I am going to uh, open it up here for questions. So in the context of discovering viable sources of geologic hydrogen, how can AI, particularly generative, generative modeling and advanced imaging be utilized to predict and locate subsurface accumulations effectively? Okay, actually there's, there's three questions in here. So I'll start with that one. That's a really good question. And I think there's some really great possibilities there. Um, you see generative AI already being used to enhance our ability to find oil and gas deposits, um, basically because it can improve our ability to reconstruct what we think the subsurface looks like. And, you know, I, I think this would be a really cool thing to look at. The problem is you need something to train your AI on. And this, this gets back to the issue I said earlier about what are the characteristics of places we need to look to find hydrogen. And we still need to figure that out. So we can't train an AI model without a little bit of data to begin with. Now, a lot of that generative AI is getting very good and training itself with very limited inputs. But I would say what we know about where to find geologic hydrogen is still too limited even for that. So we need to do some fundamental work, but that's, that's a really great point. I, I hope people keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, second part of this question, can you elaborate on any current applications or potential future developments in this area that might significantly reduce the challenges of prospecting for and recovering subsurface hydrogen? Okay, so I mentioned the uh, the new uh, projects we have going under uh, the ARPA-E program. And, um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of them, you, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, using foams and having you know, better, you know, injecting catalysts and, you know, some of the things I mentioned. So um, I would say that's what's going on. On the prospecting side, you know, that kind of gets back to the first question, like, you know, you know, there's different tools that need to be developed, I think, but I, we can leverage a lot of the expertise we have to make that happen. Um, and then finally, uh, last part of the question, additionally, how do these AI-driven approaches compare with traditional geologic survey methods in terms of accuracy, efficiency, and cost? Um, well, you know, ideally, AI helps you improve efficiency and reduce cost because, you know, you can, you know, spend less time having to acquire data and uh, you can, you know, use generative AI to make realizations. Um, accuracy, you know, that depends on the quality of your input data. And right now, I, you know, don't think we're, we're, we're quite there yet. There's, there's a lot of cool stuff happening on the oil and gas side that I think we can leverage. Let's see. I mentioned un oh, excuse me. I mentioned conventional drilling and production methods are mostly suitable. Are there any special drilling techniques needed for safe exploratory drilling? Um, so here's the thing: drilling in altered oceanic, uh, excuse me, or altered upper mantle rocks is a little bit different from drilling in what we typically think of as crystalline rocks. And, you know, this actually comes from my experience in the scientific ocean drilling community. They're a lot softer than you think. Um, and so you need to, you know, be careful about your mud program, understanding the strength of those rocks. I think, you know, that's, we need to leverage some of the expertise and other, other facets of geology. So those are the things that come to mind immediately. I'm sure there are other ones that I can't think of. Um, Apart from material selection for casing and cement, that sort of thing, what kind of adaptations to procedures, you know, mud systems, et cetera, are being used to mitigate increased explosion risks from drilling into hydrogen reservoirs? Well, I mean, you're going to approach well control, I think, fundamentally the same way you do in a natural gas well, just with the understanding that, um, yeah, if you do have a blowout, it would be much more catastrophic. Um, so, you know, beyond that, um, you know, I think I, I showed one of those photographs from uh, the Borakabugu area of the, uh, you know, the guys were wearing respirators um, when they were working near the wellhead, so you have to be aware of toxicity. Um, 
Okay. Yeah. Now here's a really good question. Have we learned anything from recent drilling in Nebraska? I looked and looked and I could really not find much available on that. I think they're keeping the results very tightly held right now. There's a lot of kind of, um, you know, kind of, uh, I, w I don't want to use the word dark, but a lot of kind of secretive stuff going on in this space right now. So we might know in a few years. Um, and then what kind of work can be done to confirm if the reservoir in Mali suspected to be regenerating hydrogen is actually renewable long term? Well, I, I think you need to figure out where it is first. Um, there's, uh, you know, it's it's possible to use um, hydrogen isotopes to uh, infer something about the source of the hydrogen. So, you know, I'm sure I'm sure somebody's looking at that. Um, but then understanding, you know, let's let's imagine that, you know, maybe it's coming from something that's getting serpentinized somewhere. I don't know what. Um, so then understanding, you know, what's the local fluid chemistry and what's you know, what's the reaction rate associated with that? There's, you know, some good work on reaction rates going on right now um, that I think, uh, you know, uh, will help us better understand that. Are there any alternative interpretations for the circular features like the Carolina Bays or the fairy circles? I mean, yeah, there's there's a whole bunch. I know um, another one is that I think it's something about a fungus. Um, so, you know, there's there's kind of these biological arguments. Um, I think there, there's also something about um, spacing of natural fractures. Um, so, you know, the the actual cause of them, I don't know if it has anything to do with the hydrogen or not. It might just be incidental. Um, and so, you know, maybe it's just you've got some kind of a fracture system with a characteristic spacing that is causing these things to form, but then you've also got a migration pathway for hydrogen or other gases. So, you know, it's, um, I, I, that's, that's my best way to answer that one. But yeah, it's, that's a really good question. Regarding the fact that gas analysis does not detect hydrogen, does this mean that conventional oil reservoirs could be producing undetected hydrogen or would it show up in the total produced gas volume regardless? I suspect that there's a lot more hydrogen being produced than we realize, okay, because of this. Um, so, I mean, it, it's going to show up in your whole, your total volume because, you know, natural gas, it contains all kinds of other stuff, you know, CO2, helium, if you're lucky, you know, things like that. Um, so it'll show up in the, in the volume, but it might be more difficult to quantify. But, um, but yeah, I, like I said, I suspect that there's, probably you know more of it coming out of the ground than we than we realize it's a that's a good point going back to the roadmap which of the three steps do you think needs the most development exploration production or transportation who um i would say exploration um and that's for a couple of reasons one is i think that's where there's the most number of unknowns um but also I think we very quickly need to answer the question about how much, you know, natural hydrogen there actually is and, you know, whether it's accumulating or being generated at a rate that makes sense for us to actually chase it down. Because if it's not, you know, that's fine. We can look at other, you know, there's other things we can do with our research time. Um, but, you know, that's kind of number one, I, I think. And, you know, I know people are, some people are already working on that. Um, and then the production would be a second one because there's a lot of kind of technological challenges that um, that I think we're just getting to um, to start to to tackle on that. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Uh, it was comprehensive and engaging. This might be a bit of a general question, but I'm curious. What frameworks do you think can be established to promote collaboration between the public sector, private industry, and academic institutions in researching and developing new technologies for hydrogen detection, production, transportation, and use? Well, um, you know, speaking you know, from the university perspective, um, we love to have joint projects, and I think you know, it's important that, you know, you mentioned public sector, that's that's a big one, because, you know, I think the national labs could have a lot to contribute here. Um, but, you know, I think um, some kind of a large uh, collaborative effort is needed on this. And we have, you know, some of those here at, at UT, um, you know, the government has funded these hydrogen hubs, which are large um, uh, efforts of this source, but, I would love to see something like this on on geologic hydrogen. Um, 
headquartered here at UT, which would be fun. Um, but, you know, I think that those sorts of things, someone's just got to get together and organize that. And um, I, I think I hope someone does that. What could be the lessons learned from other types of gas storage dealing with hydrogen? Well, you know, um, I think we we understand, uh, you know, natural gas storage pretty well. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, how much you're losing during injection and the storage process and then what you're using for your cushion gas and all that. Hydrogen is a lot more reactive. It's a lot more buoyant. Uh, it has a much lower viscosity. Um, so it diffuses more rapidly. But aside from that, it's just another gas. So, you know, I think there's a lot of lessons learned um, from that. OK, I'd like to thank you all for sticking with me through this. Um, I hope you all learned a lot. I hope you got excited about natural hydrogen. I think it, you know, we'll see where this goes. But um, thanks for coming to the webinar, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all back here on May 14th for Dr. Upuno.